Pastor, would you open in prayer? Father, as we sang this last song, I, I think of Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem as the King of Peace. And yet, in that same day, he looked over Jerusalem and wept. And he wept because most of the people rejected him. They rejected the author of peace. So, Father, <clears throat> as we come together, may we understand that we need Jesus. May we understand, Father, we need to rely on him every moment of our lives. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you open our hearts and minds to what you would have for us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Amen. thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everybody. Um, well, we have uh, Pastor. We are just a few days away from the beginning of Passion Week. Very excited about that. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do this week, yeah. next week. Uh, we got to start preparing for uh, the roundtable chapels that we'll have every day next week. It's really a highlight of the year for me. I don't know about for you. Oh, I, it's wonderful. I, it's uh, let me put it to you this way. If we were not able to have it this year, something would be missing that's crucial to that week. Yeah, so just for those that are here and those that will watch it on the video, I'll, I'll probably do an announcement like you did earlier. Um, but starting this Sunday, of course, is Palm Sunday. And, and people traditionally go to church on Palm Sunday and you know, they get palms are given out. We give palms out here in, in remembrance of that. But most people really don't know the significance, theologically, Christologically, and eschatology-wise, of the significance of Palm Sunday. So I know both of us are working on our sermons to address those issues on Sunday. Yes. So my suggestion for those that are out there, a lot of people watch us. I mean, over uh, well over 100 people watch the Sunday services and... Uh, and watch a lot of these chapels that we do in the school. We got to get the people to come out to the actual building of the church. I agree. <clears throat> so Palm Sunday, if you're going to go to a church one week of the year, other than I guess Christmas, uh, you know, Passion Week is great to come to church. So this Sunday, both of us will be preaching messages on the real meaning of what Palm Sunday really means and its significance. Uh, I haven't seen your draft outline for the sermon, but I, 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 I know that, that that'll be in there. Uh, I'm working on a few drafts of my sermon, trying to refine things a little bit and really uh, focus on you know, people's expectations on what they wanted Jesus to be yes. on that first Palm Sunday. Uh, it wasn't what people thought Jesus was to do. He didn't come for that. He came for spiritual reasons. You know? uh, so I'm going to talk about that on my Palm Sunday sermon. But then after Palm Sunday... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we will be doing chapels every day at 12.15. Uh, and they will be full hour long at least. I mean, they'll be longer chapels than normal uh, because we have a lot of material to cover. Yes. So what we propose to do during this week is really analyze and explain each day in the last week of Jesus' earthly life. Mm -hmm. Because we know that after the crucifixion on Friday, which is Good Friday, the resurrection on Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, he was on earth in a form for 40 days thereafter. That's right. So when I say, uh, you know, I would say Jesus' last week, earthly uh, week uh, of life on earth, it's true, but people would maybe take umbrage to that because he was there and present in really a kind of a, a pre-resurrect, you know, a post-resurrected body, but pre-ascension uh, yes. body, I yes. think. So uh, Monday, Pastor, we'll be talking about Jesus going into the temple and cleansing the temple. Yes. We'll get into all that. Tuesday, we'll get into Jesus confronting the religious leaders, probably related to the cleansing of the temple and other things. Wednesday, we'll talk about the betrayal of Judas, but we'll also talk about everything else that happened on Wednesday. Uh, a little bit of a surprise. There's other things that did happen on Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, of course, is traditionally known as the Last Supper, but we know that other things happen on Thursday, too. So we're going to try to cover everything that happened on uh, each day, and we'll do a special communion service on Thursday. So 
Chapel may run a little bit longer on Thursday with the communion. Friday, we have two services, right, Pastor? Yeah. We have the chapel, which we're going to go over the crucifixion. And then we have a Good Friday service here, and you have a Good Friday service at your church. We do. And your, your church service is at 7? Seven? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, okay. So uh, we have that. Uh, and then Saturday, maybe the most interesting of all the chapels that we always, we agree that Saturday is the most interesting day. Yes. Most unusual day. Yes, because we don't know. <laughs> because we don't know. We don't know what happened. We know that Jesus' body lay in the tomb. We do know that. We, we do know that. But uh, other things may have happened during that time period, and we'll explore that. And then, uh, then Easter, I'm doing the lecture and slide presentation. He, Christ has risen, uh, the significance of the empty tomb. Go over that. I've done that before. Great lecture and slide presentation. One of the best ones I have. And Pastor will be having his uh, sunrise service. Sunrise at 6. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that so we our people uh, that you know can come to that. Uh, and I recommend it. Uh, if I wasn't preparing for service, I would go to it. But it, uh, it's a neat service. Uh, there's a be, there's a uh, park right on the bay in Forky River. It's called Bayfront Park, and we meet at six. And by the time everybody gets there and settled, <clears throat> the sun is starting to come up, and it's just a beautiful uh, scenery over the bay. And we we do some singing. Uh, we got a guitar, you know, player. He, he'll lead us in music prayer and then we'll talk about um, the resurrection and the significance of the resurrection uh, and then we open up for a time of testimony you know that what does the resurrection mean to you um, a lot of times you know Easter and Christmas we know what's happened the question is so what how's it going to make a difference yeah. you know in our lives and, and then um, at 10 30 that morning we'll do our regular Easter service and um, I'm not sure where I'm going with that yet um, I'm, I'm tossing around a couple of different ideas okay but you know with everything I don't know how you do it you know with the schedule you have but with everything going on I got like so much stuff yeah. rolling around in my mind yeah yeah so that hasn't been finalized yet um, uh, Good Friday uh, I'm taking a cue from your book and uh, concentrating on the exchange of Barabbas. Oh, wow. Okay, good. Uh, wow, well, yeah. With Jesus. Yeah. Uh, nice. And uh, just going back to this week, uh, linking this back into Daniel and, uh, you know, the, the time layout of sure. Daniel. Uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem at the exact time Daniel prophesied. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's just amazing to me. Are you going to unpack that a little bit yeah. at some point? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, there's a lot going on. Um, yeah, it's exciting in a way. It's a lot of work, a lot of preparation. I still have to prepare for the chapels. I mean, I'll get to that this weekend. Uh, thankfully, my Easter sermon is a lecture and slide presentation that I pretty much do every Easter. Uh, and the reason I do that is not because I'm lazy, but because every year there's new people in church. And I always want to be primary on those big days like Christmas and, you know, uh, you know, Christmas Eve, Christmas, you know, uh, Easter, th Thanksgiving. We want to be primary. At least I want to be primary. Because I bet if I asked 100 people that go to church, uh, what's the significance of Christmas Day? Uh, I, I'd probably say 90% of them would not know that it's the day of the incarnation. Yeah. They may say the baby Jesus in the manger, but it's more than that. It's God becoming flesh. Yeah. And so I always like to go back to primacy and primary things and uh, you know certainly the, the the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, is is so important uh, to our faith that uh, I do that lecture every year because it underlines and undergirds the important uh, the, the importance of that empty tomb why that tomb is empty yeah and uh, you know back of course uh, when Holy Week took place it coincided with the Passover yeah and the slaying of the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. And the culmination of that was Good Friday because the perfect lamb. Yeah. The lamb yeah. of God was sacrificed. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, so there's a lot going on. I'm excited about it. I'm glad that uh, I, I, was not, I was feeling a little, I lost my voice, wasn't feeling so good over the weekend, uh, to say the least. But, you know, I'm on the mend here. And so I'm hopeful that by Sunday I'll be 
raring to go. Yes, yeah, sure. sure. So, uh, so that's good. So, uh, so that's the schedule. Uh, I'll, I'll do an announcement that way everybody knows about it. But let's uh, let's open up the bulletin and get to the uh, meat of the chapel here. It says uh, Psalm 37, verses one to six. Let's read this together. Do not fret because evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. So I, I picked this, Pastor, because it kind of reminds me of St. Patrick's Day a little bit, but uh, uh, what, what does that mean for you? What does that psalm say to you? Um, well, for me personally, this has been important for me over the years because, as you know, life happens and some of the things in life aren't pleasant. Yeah. And it's easy to, to go into the pity party and look around and say, you know, there's Joe Blow out there. He's doing everything wrong. He seems to have no cares in the world. Yeah. It does appear that way oftentimes. <laughs> it, it, it does. It yeah. does. Um, and so, you know, David writes this, I'm sure, at a tough time in his life. Uh, and in his conversation with the Lord on this, you know, this is the conclusion he comes to as the Lord, don't, don't fret because of evil men or be envious of them <coughs> because they're, that's going to be temporary. It's going to yeah. be taken care of. Uh, trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in, uh, in the Lord. Uh, this this is saying okay to me. Anyhow, um, no matter what injustice I perceive around me, that God's still in control, and my um, purpose is not to uh, focus on the injustice, but to focus on how I walk through that uh, in trusting trusting the Lord. Uh, and and just you know, I, this gets to me. I, and delight yourself in the Lord; He will give give you the desires of your heart. Um, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, and I take that uh, partly to mean resting in in His province, uh, we will be not seeking our will, but seeking His will. Then, and what we ask in His will. He'll give to us. Now that's uh, Pastor. I, I don't know if there could be a better explanation for uh, Psalm 37. That the portion of it, a, you know, uh, to show my simplicity. The only reason I chose it was because the, the green grass and the green plants, and it reminded me of somewhat of St. Patrick's Day. But uh, but I think that you you hit the nail on the head with that, and you really gave a good analysis. What do you what do others think about the Psalm, Mitch? I right, so I have to say it this way. <clears throat> I come here with a purpose. Everywhere I go, I go with a purpose. And the purpose is I'm led by the Holy Spirit. Now, last week, I learned something very important by something you wrote on the front of your bulletin, which was Mark 11:24. Yeah. For this reason I am telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe and trust that it is granted to you and you will get it. Now I come this week. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires mm. of your heart. Mm. If I believe in what I'm, re I'm hearing, and if what I'm hearing I go and do, say it and do it, it will be, it will happen. That's it. So these two, for me, these two weeks, these two portions of scripture, one last week, one this week, are part of the tapestry. That's right, yeah. I, I mean, what you're saying is, 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 is beautifully said. And the only, the only wow. thing I would, the only, like kind of asterisk I would put that that's implicit in what you said is that if it be the Lord's will right yeah so it's always everything is tempered with if it be your will of God Absolutely. right and so but I but I agree and and I, and I like how you said you said that and it certainly does um, you know the Lord does give us these promises you know and, and certainly if we're in God's will let me say let me almost reverse it See, people look at it like they pray, and then they don't get the answer they want, and therefore God didn't answer the prayer they wanted. I suggest that when you're led by the Holy Spirit and living according to the way God wants you to live, and you're, and you're praying these prayers, 
you're praying in accordance with the will of God, and they're always going to be uh, they're always going to be in unison with one another. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so if we we're praying for something that's outside the will of God, well, it, God is certainly not going to answer that prayer with the way we want it answered because it's repugnant to His will for our lives. Okay. So, uh, so I think there's this. If you can picture the spiritual safety net in our prayers, and the safety net is God's will. That I've prayed for things in my life, and I didn't get what I prayed for, and most often within a short period of time it came apparent to me that that would not not have been good yeah exactly. yeah that's good yeah now sometimes that's we don't get that answer and we it's unknown but it's known in the province of god right pastor yes. and you have to trust yes. us thank you well and as trust is a, is a big theme here right trust in the lord do good right yeah. uh, how do we, how do we know we're doing good we're doing good by following his word uh, dwell in the and I think this is the, I hate to use the word safety net, but this is the safety net uh, of trusting the Lord. That when we're in his will, yeah, we can rest and enjoy the land and, and safe pastures. You know, uh, Pastor, I, I, like, I like that safety net concept in a way. And, um, you know, because it, 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 it almost is, for me at least, it takes a lot of anxiety away. Yeah. and worriness away mm -hmm. and really fear away where there's a lack of faith right? right but when we rest in him and we're in his will there's just this breath that we can just breathe easier right yeah yeah oh, no, what do you th what do you think I'll open it up for everybody anybody I have Melissa yeah what do you think so about a week ago a, a person came against me and my beliefs and she was a practicer of the occult and she had this long drawn out conversation with me and everything she said to me was this is helping my life this is helping me feel better this is doing this for me this is doing that for me but she didn't say anything about her eternity it was all about right. the here and now for, for now and in these first Four verses that's exactly what it's talking about she's doing wrong but it's going to wither away it's going to die and it's going to be she's going to be gone yeah. you know where where we're thinking about eternity and this life is really short you know <coughs> I'd say this though too the way the wicked spiritual forces and the devil work it's like he uses people for a time period and then discards them yes. anyway yeah. you know so I, I don't think anything is ever uh, lasting uh, into eternity uh, and and I think that that's problematic with um, with a lot of the cults and the, and those practitioners you know there is a if we believe ultimate truth is that God created us in his image and he left us with the ability to have free will and and avoid in a way in our lives that can only be filled by the God void right the God particle right the Holy Spirit uh, and if that's true, and you're connecting with other wicked spiritual forces, it's only a matter of time before it deteriorates you right. uh, spiritually, and it will, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. And so you, you, you pray for that person, and, uh, and I'm sure you did. Uh, but, you know, this is what we're up against yeah. in the world of which we live. And, uh, and you know, it's temporary for them. You know, they're not going to have eternal life. You know, I... I if they stay in there. I, I, I drove by a church the other day. I, I think Sunday it was filled. And and uh, I won't, won't, of course, mention what church it is, uh, but it's a church in, 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 in Ocean County. And, and we know that there's been some, uh, you know, some questionable practices uh, at the church. And, and, and it makes you wonder, uh, people are, are ignorant, unfortunately, to the things of God. And... I blame nobody other than ourselves as pastors right. because we have failed to we have failed to teach properly and we have failed to make disciples yeah. you know and uh, and that's why you have <coughs> churches that are filled that are preaching heresy uh, not not good right you know we and we I mean you made a comment to me a while back 
uh, we were talking about our responsibility and the failure of the church, you know, and and you said you're hard on the church, and yeah. and yeah. yes, but I'm also hard on myself too, yeah. you know, because we we're, we're failing to make disciples. Yeah, uh, I think we have to be hard on ourselves and hard on the church. You know, if if we're, I mean, if we look at ourselves and we read the Book of Revelation. And we say, oh well, we're 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 the, we're the Church of Philadelphia, we're the Church of Love, we're the Church of Smyrna. You know, we got everything going on right. I mean, that's a dangerous area to be in. Yeah, I'd much rather be uh, Laodicea and those other churches, and, and look at my, look at ourselves and say, listen, we have a long way to go, and we've got to improve in these areas, yes. and we can't become complacent. And once you become complacent, look. We don't have we don't have a hundred percent perfect theology at this church nor at your church, yeah, that's right. and and we won't until we transition from this life to the next with Jesus right. because it, it, then it's perfect. But we work toward that, and we have a standard, and we work toward that standard. Uh, and it's one thing to fall short or make a mistake or not, you know, those issues. But it, it's a whole different ball game to have a skewed theology yes. because then there's no hope. That's correct. That's correct. And that's what that's what I see in here. Half the stuff I hear. Uh, you know, it, it's shocking to me that there's followers of people uh, that are saying these things. I, I just can't quite understand that. And it's locally too. It's uh, you know, you don't have to go more than five miles from this, from where we're right here. Yeah. But, uh, I think the biggest problem is that people are afraid of offending somebody else. I hear people say, "Well, I don't say that to anybody because I don't want." You know, they can believe whatever they want to believe, but if they're believing something that's not true. Well, I think it's worse than that because. It's not, I don't think that that's really true in a way, Melissa. They may say that to you, but if they're under a place that's preaching these things that are contrary to the Bible, and they're, per, they're in there and then they're saying, well, I don't want to offend anybody, you know, that's disingenuous. They've got to, they, they've got to get out of there and get into a, a solid church that has a correct theology, or they're going to wind up, uh, it's going to be very problematic. I mean, it's... Uh, if, 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 it's, if they're not being taught properly and they're not reading for themselves and they're not becoming disciples, I mean, yeah. as soon as the circumstance, you know, they're, they're done. You the know, gospel so. in itself is offensive mm -hmm. because it addresses our pride. And if we don't want to offend anybody, I'm going to say it this way. We have no need of a Savior if we don't understand how wicked and lost we are and we can't rescue ourselves right that's going to offend some people and i think one of the gifts of, of getting older if i could put it that way is i don't care <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah I, mean, I, I really don't i mean you don't say it brutally but listen the gospel's going to offend jesus offended yeah right? yeah and I, if we're not offending in the right way then Perhaps we better relook at what we're preaching. You know, I, I opened today, I'll tell you why I opened with uh, the faith of the centurion. The reason I opened with the story of the faith of the centurion is because we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll, we'll get to what we're talking about today, is St. Patrick. Mm -hmm. Because one of St. Patrick's uh, most important scriptures, at least portions of it, what he did was this. He, he would reference... Matthew chapter 8, but he wouldn't start with verse uh, 10. He would start with verse 11. And in verse 11 it says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He, he would always focus on Matthew 8 verse 11. Uh, so that's the reason why I opened with the faith of the centurion because it's found within the confines of this story uh, of this great faith by the centurion uh, leader with Jesus. So, uh, you know, Patrick knew his scripture. And uh, so why don't, we, why don't we talk about St. Patrick's Day and St. Patrick. And uh, does anybody want to read for me uh, Matthew chapter 28 on the back of the bulletin? Dan, you want to read that? Sure. sure. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you, Dan. So, Pastor, I, I selected this scripture for the St. Patrick's Day uh, lecture. Uh, and, and I'm not asking you to get into my mind as to why I chose that, but why would you think that that would be a relevant uh, portion of Scripture to apply to the life of, of St. Patrick? This was his driving force. I, I think he took this very seriously, and uh, this motivated him to say, if I'm a Christ follower, I need to be doing this. Uh, Doing what, Pastor? Explain that to us a little bit. What, bringing, what? bringing the gospel uh, and making disciples of people to, to teach them all that Jesus had taught him. Yeah. So they can go out and do the same thing. You know, that's ultimately the, you know, discipleship, we throw the word around, but it's, it's to help us to grow and become more Christ-like from the inside out so that... Um, if I can put it this way, who we are in private is not uh, different from who we are in public. It shouldn't be, right? It shouldn't be. Uh, you know, uh, the, the process of discipleship uh, should bring uh, congruity to those two things. Yeah, I like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a maturing process for all of us, uh, and we're still a work in, pro in process. But I think, my opinion, from what I know about St. Patrick, uh, this, if I can say it, this was his life verse. He knew what it was. He knew what the new birth was. He knew what it mean. He used it the, the term born again. Yeah. Correct? Yes. And he says, we all need it. I needed it. Yes. You know? Uh, and his passion, I think, was that of Paul's, really, to go and share the gospel with everybody and disciple and disciple. Yeah. I think this is what's missing. In the American church. Yeah, I mean, you've made really three good points. I mean, let, let's just unpack that a little bit. But this portion of Matthew is 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 commonly referred to as the Great Commission, and it's the directives that Jesus gave to the disciples to go into the world, proclaim the gospel, the kingdom of God, and then make disciples of the people. So that was the the last directive that he gave the disciples and the church, right? Clearly. Patrick, St. Patrick internalized this and it really was his you know, mission statement, yeah. right? His that's mission that's statement that's was it. the Great Commission to go out into the world and make disciples of the pagans. That was, you know, I I as rough as that may sound, uh, he referenced them as pagans and uh, snakes and, yeah. you know, I've got to convert them to Christianity and that was his mission and that's why I selected uh, the, the Great Commission as Patrick's mission and, uh, and he was obedient to that <clears throat> but it, the third point, I think, Pastor, you said is that uh, this, you know, has to be accomplished by the church too. Yeah. You know, the church has to do better, and the church has always been very weak at making disciples. But the disciples that the church makes, see, there's a balance. I think the church uh, has failed to make as many disciples as it should be making. Correct. But in the same token, when the church makes disciples, the church is making disciples. Yeah. Amen. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, there's a lot of good disciples out there that are committed to the Lord, that are studying and praying and, and going to church and, and going out into the world and making a difference. I mean, they're disciples. They're mature Christians. Yes. Uh, so <coughs> when, when the church spits out a disciple, it's a good one. Yes. The problem is the church isn't focused on spitting out disciples. Sometimes they're more focused on building a program, administering the program, raising the revenue to administrate the program or the new building, uh, and that becomes the focus. Yeah. Not on where, if Jesus were there, I think he would say something to this. Don't worry about building that new building. Don't worry about you know implementing the new program. Start teaching the people everything that I've commanded. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I, I don't know when this started, but when we got so program happy, uh, in the church, you know, everybody had the latest and greatest program. Yeah. It was nothing more than getting on a trend. Yeah. And it's very superficial, very, uh, it, as, as Solomon would say, it's like the wind. It's here yeah. and it's gone. I was a part of churches that had a trend every different month. You know, every month or every quarter there was a new trend uh, trying to spurn 
a move of God, and, and, and little do people realize that, uh, you know, it, that's that's in the province of God. That's right. And God has to have, I would say, like a landing pad, you know, or the right landing pad for the visitation. Yeah. So your job isn't to uh, bring in that move of God, because you can't, it's a move of God, it's God ordained, Agreed. but what we can do is is make all preparations so it would be the right place to visit, yes. or the right place for the uh, visitation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think we got it backwards, though. So, uh, thoughts on uh, St. Patrick's? Thoughts? On, yeah, look. Well, you were talking about discipleship. Yeah. And I think a very good example of disciples was the example Jesus gave on Holy Thursday when he washed the feet of the twelve. Yeah. He said, I have given you example that you also should do. And that's how he wants us to teach, by example. Hmm. Very good. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's not so much in the act of the foot washing that took place. I mean, there was a, a communion. The Last Supper was celebrated uh, on that day. But I think it was Jesus, the crux was a spiritual mentality and attitude of humility yeah. and service. Yes. And, and that's something that, you know, as far as work, you know, and I'm not trying to speak for pastor, but we, we do, we speak a lot and we're on the same page, you know, theologically uh, and ministry-wise, but, you know, we don't look at our job as lead pastor, head pastor, or founding pastor, whatever it may be. I don't really refer to myself as that at all. You'll never hear me say that. It's just not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm a pastor that is laboring in the field, yeah. you know, with everybody else. But, you know, some people think that they're in an elevated position here as compared to there, right. uh, and you're not. You know, you, 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 you're no different. You know, you just have a different office and a different function, but uh, you can't uh, think that you're better. Right. And, and oftentimes the pulpit has that air of, uh, uh, of being better than everybody or talking down to people, and, and you know, you ought not want to do that. No, no, and because once you do that, you know, pride takes over and all yeah. the, the stuff that comes with it. But if you ever study church architecture. It's very interesting. Uh, you can tell a lot about a church and the architecture of you know, the platform and all. The reason why the pulpit was put higher than everybody else is because the Word of God is the final authority. Hmm. The person standing behind it is the servant. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if you go into some mainline churches, the pulpit is on the side. Still may be elevated, but it's on the side. It's not the main focus. The main focus a lot of times is the altar, you know, or, you know, what, whatever else is back there. Uh, but we, uh, you can walk into any church and, and learn from the way it's structured what's important and what's not important, what's, you know, what's viewed on, on, on the side. Um, one of the saddest things, I don't know if you remember this, um, maybe 10 <coughs> years ago, 11 years ago, going back to Melissa's comment before, in an effort not to offend anybody, a lot of evangelical churches took their crosses down. And I was heartbroken, you know, to, to hear this. Um, we're on the wrong path then. We really are on the wrong path. Not that we venerate the cross, but the cross has great meaning for us. Um, without, you know, without the cross, we're done. You know, we're done. So we get into these things that... Yeah you know, are ultimately detrimental, you know, to, to people, to, to the faith. Um, we always have to remember, I, you know, I, I tell our people, and I think you, you feel the same way, um, what we do in the church is no different than what anybody else does in the church in the sense that everybody's part of the same body, right? And we have our roles to play in that, and everybody's just as important. <clears throat> we're all bound by love. We're all bound by by the unity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, we're all sinners saved by grace. And once we start to view ourselves uh, elevated, uh, then we're on dangerous ground. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I, I look at the the services lately that we've been having, and and I'm grateful for Dennis and and the music. It's really been. Uh, tremendous spirit infused in the services and yeah. I think I, I can sense that people really sense uh, you know there's a powerful sense of the spirit here during the services you know you, you can tangibly yes. you can tangibly oh, yeah. feel that uh, you know and it's it's very unusual 
Um, I don't think that's everywhere, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I've, I've been sensing it the last several weeks. Uh, have you, Dennis, I mean, you don't really talk much, yeah. but uh, how have you, I mean, we've, we've had good, you know, it's been good attendance, people have been coming out, and yeah. uh, what do you think about the services, especially during the, the, the music time? I mean, you're, you're, you see everything going on, I don't see anything, I'm just, yeah, I'm watching you. I'm watching the words. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> but do you sense that, Dennis? I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's been like, it's been like really good, like leading up until like Easter and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. Great music. They've been really uh, interacting with you. Right. They, they, yeah. They're not just watching you perform. Right. Yeah. They're they're they're, they're part of it. it. Yeah. So yeah. it's been really good lately. Yeah. I know Mitch really yeah. enjoys yeah. it. You know. <laughs> um, it ignites something deep inside of me that's spiritual, yeah. and <clears throat> it's not a form of entertainment. I'm not looking to show myself off. Even if you're on camera, Mitch, you know. I don't even think about that. Actually, I'm probably in the way. But, um, no, you're actually not. You're actually doing, you do really well. Thank you. You do no, really but well. The point, really serious, is, um, and I don't have the time, we, this is not the time for it, but God, I have medical reports that said I'm not going to be able to jump, I'm not going to be able to breathe, I'm not going to be able to do these things. Every time I do something like that, and I'm, um, Melod not melodramatic, but dramatic. Well, you're 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 worshiping the Lord. Yeah. It's totally appropriate. I mean, it's, and, yeah. for him, it's yeah. showing people. It's showing. It's just exhibiting what God has done in me. Well, you're very excited about it, and and, and it's it's really quite beautiful. The the music is beautiful. The worship is beautiful. So well, we're alive. You know, yeah. So well. Any other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Well, music is really my favorite. I mean, I, I love to sing and I love to be involved in, in singing. Um, when I was in intermediate school and high school, I was in the chorus. Oh, wow. And we, we would put on different programs and different songs. But I lost my voice when I had that car accident. Mm -hmm. So I can't sing as well. But it's one of my favorite times when I get up in the morning and I pray and wow. I listen to music. Beautiful. And that gets my day going. Well, I'm going to go to the musician now, too. So, Lou, what do you think? I mean, you are, you know, you're music director for 40-something years at the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a beautiful job. You do a lot here for, I know Dennis relies on you, and you do uh, oftentimes mm -hmm. solos here. You fill in for Dennis when he's not here. Uh, you do a beautiful job. Like, how have you uh, been enjoying the music? You know, you're, you're, you're singing the songs. You're up here on the stage. How do you feel uh, when you're singing these songs well, and the interaction? You know immediately when the Holy Spirit takes over, because all of a sudden, the timing doesn't matter. The heart takes over. Right. The heck with the music. Right. We're just going to let it rip. Right. You know? And when that happens, the whole place rocks. Have, yes. you, have, you, have you been experiencing that the last few weeks Yes. Here? It's really been noticeable. Yes, and and every, everybody's getting into it. Yeah. You know, the minute you do that, that's the Holy Spirit taking yeah. over. Yeah, I, I just sit back and watch and, you know, look, for me, people shouldn't gauge what I do on a Sunday because, to me, it's, 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 it's a work day. Uh, I, I, it's not. It's not a time for me. I don't work. I'm always. I'm concentrating. I'm figuring out what I'm going to lecture on. What I'm thinking about. I have to monitor everything to make sure nothing happens. That everybody's secure. So there's a lot of things going on in my mind. And it, it, if I don't worship, it's not because I'm. Not, I don't want to worship. It's just that I have a job to do. You know what I'm saying? I, I and I worship the Lord oftentimes. You know, but uh, right before the sermon, and uh, I'm thinking a lot of things. I'm trying to rehash in my mind what I'm going to be praying about what I'm going to be leading, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to move me, how, how I'm going to lecture, if I have to make any adjustments to my sermon. So there's a lot there's a lot of moving parts going in on there, but I, I, I enjoy watching people worship the Lord. Years ago, I forget how many years ago uh, this was, uh, Walt Healy uh, invited uh, my church to come for a night of praise. And either you brought your praise band or a choir, with you. Sharon was with with me then. So we brought our choir up. There were, I think there were 20 or 25 churches that responded, some from out of state. And, you know, I had mixed feelings about it. I didn't want it to be like the Battle of the Bands or, you know, anything like that. But God taught me a really great lesson that night. Um, there was a uh, Amish choir that came and in their particular church they don't use instruments it was just all 
Acapella. Acapulco. Uh, and they they came on last. After all the noise, after all you know, all the stuff, they started singing. You could hear a pin drop. The presence of God was just so incredible. You could hear. I, I, there wasn't a peep. And after they were done, people got on their feet crying and and you know uh, praising. And that that's. No, I'm not coming down against instruments, Dennis. You know me better than that. Uh, <laughs> well, because you're a musician yourself. Yeah, I am. Uh, but it, it it just goes to show what, that God can use people where they are in powerful ways. And I'll never forget that. And Walt, uh, Walt asked me to close the service. You know, and what an honor. I mean, I I, w I was speechless to see that. That was the first time I ever experienced something like that. And, and God, the lesson that God taught me was, listen, when people seek me, I'll be there. Yeah. You know, I'll be there. Well, it's a beautiful story. Um, yeah, well, well I, you know, well, 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 I'll let you get to you in a minute, but I, I do want to remind you, we're going to start the service around 945 on, on, on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, just to have that, that tremendous ability to have that, you know, 45 minutes of worship or so, you know, so it really... Uh, and that seems to work, and uh, and the worship has just been, uh, you know, thankfully people have been coming out, and, and we're still, a lot of people aren't coming every week, and we're still, you know, it's still fairly, uh, you know, uh, good turnouts, you know, so I'm happy about that. I hope everybody would come at the same time, the church would be fully full, yeah. but, uh, you know, maybe that's wishful thinking, but uh, Lou, and then... And I just want to say what Pastor was talking about, uh, it, it kind of struck a chord with me, because, you know, you're talking about different genres of music yeah. that you could still get that same uh, spirit. And it kind of coincides with the reading, there are many gifts, but the yes. same spirit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, Mitch. And I, I go back to thinking, uh, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies who he calls. So you could have someone like me who really, in a concert, they would throw me out. No, I have no voice. I have no pitch. I'm deaf. I can't hear the note. I can't control what comes out. Well, you wouldn't make the cut with Dennis then. <laughs> no, I mean that. But yet, <coughs> but yet, my worship is allowed to project. Yeah, I, I've said, uh, well, kidding, you know, I've sent Dennis a few, I'm like, hey, Dennis, they want to try out for the choir, you know, it didn't work out too good, but uh, anyway. So, uh, final thoughts, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day is really, it, it, it's, it lost its meaning, certainly, in our society and culture. I mean, it's just a day of revelry, drinking, partying, and it really is a two-week it's a two week or three week deal because whenever they have the St. Patrick's Day parades, that's when, you know, St. Patrick's Day is. And, uh, and I think that it does disservice to St. Patrick, who really was a committed, born again Christian. Yeah. I mean, he was committed to the gospel, he was committed to evangelism, de dedicated his life and everything he was to uh, proclaiming the gospel uh, to, the, to those he deemed pagan Irishmen, you know, and uh, changed the trajectory of that. Uh, continent, really, in a way that, that certainly uh, that nation. Uh, it'd be nice to see a real move of God in Ireland, you know, yeah. with 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 its roots in in really St. Patrick, who really, as you said, Pastor, really reminds me of, of the Apostle Paul in many ways. You know, he used. I didn't explain this. Uh, I, I should have did a better job in the lecture, but you know, he used the the three the shamrock, the three leaf clover. To, to, to teach on the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the, the, it, it, what he used it for was he would tell them that, see this, this uh, shamrock, this, uh, it, it's one, one flower, yeah. you know. It, it has one th flower but three petals, mm. uh, which signify one flower with three petals. So you have the Father is one petal, the sun is another petal, and the Holy Spirit is, is one, but they're not three separate flowers, they're one flower. Yeah. And so he would use that, and uh, it's a very good teaching tool. And I wrote about that in my, in my latest book about, uh, you know, uh, three petals, one flower, uh, which, which was really a, a something along the lines of what Patrick was teaching with, with the Holy Spirit. So uh, 
you know, he took a lot of heat for that. Uh, you know, he, there's also some issue about the Celtic cross, about the, the circle around it, and that he, it, w it was pagan in a way, and he was using it to, uh, so we can connect with these these pagans. I mean, they were, as and I argued in, in the lecture that really Paul did the same thing. He, 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 he went into the uh, uh, Mars Hill, and, and he doesn't worship some unknown god, and he wasn't, you know, he was he referenced an unknown god because for their benefit, but yeah. but he knew who the unknown god was it was Jesus Christ, and he wanted to disclose that. So it was a real, it was a cute way and a very intellectual yeah. way of, of doing it. But a lot of people, a lot of theologians have a lot of trouble, and me and Pastor have talked about. I've written a chapter. I, I've written I've written on the Mars Hill sermon, and and a lot of people have a lot of problems with him referencing, you know non-canonical, non-scripture, uh, but Jude does, all, you know, yeah. Jude, the brother of Jesus, references the assumption of Moses, mm -hmm. which is non-canonical writings, right in scripture. Yeah. You know, so yeah. there's some uh, there's some authority for that. Uh, certainly there's there's authority for Homer and the Iliad and those things yeah. that Paul quoted, but, uh, <coughs> you know, so uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, you know, I'm glad we had people come out to St. Patrick's Day. I was wor worried that People were going to be at the bars early that day, <laughs> but uh, we had a nice turnout. And we had a real good service. Yeah. Any thought? Any concluding thoughts, Pastor? Or? No, I, I. You know, it's just good stuff. It, yeah. it just it serves at least to remind me why we need to go forward. Yeah. And how we need to go forward. Yeah. It's not easy, too. I mean, there's no. a, you know, it's not. You know, certainly since COVID, uh, the offerings have been substantially down. We're we're you know, we're substantially down in the offerings, uh, you know, and uh, uh, it makes things more difficult, uh, but, you know, you just find a way to make it through and yeah. uh, and do it, and hopefully people will come and appreciate what you do, and, you know, that's in the, that's in the sovereignty of God, you know, right. we're, we just have to do our job, right? I can't worry about all that other stuff. Yeah. So, uh, any other concluding thoughts before I let Pastor close? We're at 115. <laughs> Pastor, why don't you close in prayer? Father, I pray that um, as we as come into Palm Sunday and we look at Holy Week and uh, and the culmination of, of that is the resurrection on Easter Sunday, I pray that like St. Patrick, you would burn into our hearts the desire to make disciples, to teach them all that you taught us to teach them to obey father that that phrase is is intriguing to me in the great commission to teach them to obey father someone along the way taught me to obey may we may we continue to teach people that in obeying your commission is great freedom and so, Father, would you dismiss us with great anticipation for what will uh, happen this Sunday and, and the days after that, and help us, Father, make disciples of others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, good seeing you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank good you. seeing all of you. And uh, we will uh, see each other on Sunday, and we have class on Sunday. Class. And then next Sunday, we don't have class, of course, it's Easter. So uh, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday and uh, thereafter. Sounds good.